And our panelists, starting from my left, the first is Latifa Simon. She's program director from the Rosenberg Foundation. She's an advocate for low-income young women and girls and for juvenile and criminal justice reform. At 19, Latifa was appointed executive director of the Center for Young Women's Development. She then created San Francisco's first reentry services division, launching Back on Track, a national program model. And I want to highlight, I mean, you can read more about her bio in your program, but I want to highlight one thing. She was selected as a MacArthur Genius Fellow, so I will encourage Alex to ask her really, really hard questions. <laughs> Following Latifa is Jose Quinones, who is the founding CEO of Mission Asset Fund, an award-winning nonprofit with an innovative national model for integrating underserved low-income communities into the financial mainstream. He's a passionate advocate for social justice and highly regarded in the consumer finance field. Jose holds many impressive awards and appointments, including completion of the two-year Leader Spring Fellowship in 2011. Welcome, Jose. And last but certainly not least, Christina Bowie is Vice President of Enterprise Solutions for Robert Half. She has over 16 years in senior leadership and business development in the professional services industry, nine of which were in engineering and over seven years in financial management services. Breaking glass ceilings for women and women of color in the private sector, Christina is active on the boards of Asian Immigrant Women Advocates and the Asian Pacific Fund and St. Brendan Parish in San Francisco. Welcome, Christina. I want to say that this is just a conduit for the things we all believe in, right? For social justice and change. And I think it's um, important to start with setting the baseline. You're in the nation state of Berkeley right now, but you're actually part of Alameda County. <laughs> so the data that I'll give you is um, real and pressing. Uh, in 1962, African Americans in Alameda County lived 4.3 years less than their white counterparts. So remember, I'm the health department. We sign the birth and death certificates. We, we keep this data. This is Alameda County data. Uh, if you fast forward to today, we have a horrible piece of data to report. That number is now nine years. So at the most basic and simple level, the most simple health equity data that we could possibly give you, which is how long do you get to live, we're losing. So the leadership that we've offered to date has been insufficient to the task that we face. And I can tell you, if you live in this county, how long you're going to live by the zip code that you reside in. So and I want to clearly uh, thank the leaders who brought this consciousness to me, Dr. Tony Eiton, uh, Arnold Perkins, and many others. So this essential idea that equity means not that everyone gets the same, but that you get what you need. Leadership has, to date, we have not done what we need to do to address the challenges that faces, face our communities. 40% of the children in this community are born into poverty. Literally in the flatlands of Berkeley, you have a 15 year life expectancy difference by uh, income level. So with that sobering data, um, to hold the importance of this conversation, um, I'm gonna start by saying that one of the essential pieces of leadership in my experience, and remember I was handed the keys to a $800 million organization four months before the Affordable Care Act passed. And we've had uh, our mouth on the fire hydrant for the last four or five years. And we've learned, essentially, you don't treat away the things that produce poor health outcomes. Uh, Oakland Unified School District is the first school district in the nation to guarantee universal access to health care. That's not helping, fewer kids, that's not helping uh, fewer kids achieve a high school diploma and gain access to the economic justice that we know is essential. So an essential part of our experience has been that you have to, the journey out is the journey in. Can you hear me in the back? I hear some hands up. Okay. Uh, the journey out is the journey in. So the extraordinary leaders that I'm going to um, dig into, um, I'm going to ask them to reflect carefully on their own experience of social justice and equity and mine their past for those experiences and tools that they use in the present. Uh, in the organizations they lead. So, you know, we're going to ask for some personal stories here. So I ask you res to respect our panelists because my background is behavioral health and I can't help it. Uh, I'm fascinated by the essential. So my job is to ask our panelists to begin. Um, how has your personal experience, how has your background in this work been informed by your life experience before you became a leader in the position that you're currently in? And Latif, I'm going to start with you because you're the furthest away. I knew it. <laughs> 
was like, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? And I thought I had two people before me to figure that out. Oh, you can't hear me? What about now? Yes or no? I'm never told that I'm talking too softly, so this is new for me. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> okay, how about now? Oh, excellent. Um, you know, it's an interesting question, and we talked a little bit about it um, in prep for, for the panel. Um, I'm 38 years old, um, and for me, um, I remember having conversations with friends of mine in high school thinking that if we lived to 40, that we would be old. Um, mm -hmm. And when I got into youth activism, I remember folks telling the older folks who are 25 and older to leave the room. So it's a really interesting space that I'm in right now, <laughs> having an, uh, a 19-year-old daughter um, tell me the same things. Um, so I grew up in the Western Edition in San Francisco, and there's three black people left in San Francisco, but the, <laughs> the ones... <laughs> The ones who are still there, um, who've been there for quite some time, um, many share the experiences of the, of the 1980s in San Francisco and low-income communities when crack cocaine, uh, the proliferation of, of crack cocaine and the horrible failed policies um, that, that followed, I felt it, I saw it. Um, it was ingrained in me, uh, the failed war on drugs. And, and seeing and understanding how both federal, local, state, city policies um, impacted my home, my community, the folks across the street from me. Every single pain, um, whether it be from hunger, whether it be from seeing officers slam black men down on the concrete, I saw it all and it informed me. HIV informed me. My godfather died of AIDS and very few folks wanted to touch him. Um, and I got politicized at a very early age, as do most young poor people, um, as do most young people who grow up with absolutely nothing. Um, but thank God I, I found a physical, mental, spiritual space to develop that analysis. Um, and when I was 17 years old, I was hired at an organization called the Street Survival Project, which later then became the Center for Young Women's Development, where that historical social uh, analysis actually got honed and drove me into activism. And I got paid to be an organizer and an ethnographer and a street outreach worker. And I was able to work with young women who looked like myself, um, who were in the depths of hell and the tenderloin and SRO hotels and in juvenile halls. And how could I not want to do this work for the rest of my life? Because I got this unique privilege to work with my sisters. Um, so everything that I am has been always informed by the women who stood beside me, um, and um, including my daughter. I was a teen mom. And thank God for those experiences, because the work that I will continue to do and I, in here, um, I am accountable to each and every young woman that I've worked for. And though they've been in the thousands. And so that accountability structure and framework, thank God for it, because it keeps me honest. Yeah, and just if I, if I could, do you remember when you were 17, how you connected to that organization? Do you remember the, like, can you give yeah, us the details of that? I do, I dropped out of high school to work full time um, at Taco Bell <laughs> and because I needed to work. And I um, became a shift manager, which was illegal, I learned at the time. <laughs> like operating machines I wasn't supposed to operate. And hiring folks, I was told actually by the general manager of the county to hire non-English speaking folks because they work longer and they don't complain. Mm. Right? Mm. And, I, <laughs> and there are so many things wrong with, with, with being a low paid worker at that time and seeing the exploitation of people who were my mothers and my aunties and my uncles. I'm from different corners of the globe, but I was standing at the register one day and a friend of mine told me, I got a job that pays $8.50 an hour and all we have to do is go out into the tenderloin and give out condoms and bleach and train people how to clean their abscesses. I was like, okay, I can do that. Um, and that, that job opportunity, it was a job uh, of being a youth outreach worker in, in, the, in the height of, of the explosion of HIV in San Francisco, especially among um, straight black women, young black women, uh, changed my life. I was able to go back to high school and finish high school. 
Um, and so that's how I connected. It was a peer, a young woman that I had known in my community deeply who loved me, came to order some tacos, changed my life forever. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, as I shift to Jose, let that be a lesson to all the folks who say we shouldn't pay stipends and that peers, peer to peer doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Latifa. So, Jose, can you tell a little bit of, of your story? Yeah, I, first I want to thank, you know, um, for the, you know, it's a privilege to be here today, so thank you for, the, for inviting me to, to, to speak and share some of my own story to you. Um, I, you know, I, I've been reflecting on this quite a bit late, as of late about, you know, what is it that is actually motivating, you know, me to do this work and, and uh, you know, as we build math and, and even kind of going into the next phase of, of the organization. And, and, and I always kind of go back to my childhood because that, that really is the lessons that I learned that I actually still care to, uh, to today. Um, you know, I, I was like in my 20s when I realized that, you know, my mother, you know, actually died because we were poor. Uh, you know, she passed away when I was nine. My father, you know, was, uh, you know, brutally assassinated when I was two. And, and when I was nine, we actually came to the United States, you know, on the dark of night. Uh, I remember it was July 4th, 1980, when we were crossing, or we were being led, you know, to cross the border uh, in, in the United States. And, and, and I think about that all the time, actually. I think about, you know, what, as a kid, as a child, you know, what it, we needed to do to survive you know, having had this, you know, this, this, this huge disruption in our lives, or having lost, you know, uh, lost our, our parents, and, and then all, and really quickly, you know, being emerged, emerged into a new society, a new culture, and then being forced to be in the sidelines, in the shadows, hidden, you know, and, afra and afraid of being, you know, uh, being deported, you know, because of that. And that actually did a number on me. It did an, a huge number on who, you know, who I perceived to be myself and, and my family. But, but thank God I had siblings. I had, you know, extended family to, to actually uh, uh, to help us through, through those very rough years. And, and, then, and it's really, you know, the lesson about us coming together and helping each other in the, in the, in the darkest of times uh, that, that we were able to survive that. And, uh, and, and, but I see that story as my own, right? You know, but I also see that story reflecting in a lot of our clients, a lot of people that we work with, a lot of people that we associate with, because we all have our own stories, our own sort of you know, uh, challenges that we have to overcome. It's just that some people have a lot more resources to help them overcome those things than others. And so what I wanted to do with my life is to say, well, you know, uh, you know people just because they were, you know, they, either they were raised in an environment where, you know, we were afflicted with drugs and, and so forth, or, or, or because, you know, things happen in our lives, it doesn't mean that we're less than or, the, or that we are not, are, are not and don't require help or, or, or we shouldn't, you know, be, have access to resources. I mean, we're not less than humans just because we're in the shadows. And in fact, I think we are a little bit more so and we can bring a lot more to the table. So, so I, I wanted to kind of, you know, dedicate my life, my, my career to kind of bring about, you know, those lessons and then help more people that are in the shadows to kind of come into, into the mainstream. Uh, thanks. Can I ask you directly? And you, you told us some uh, great stories, but from that experience of being in the shadows and in, in your immigration story, can you na can you name a specific thing or an experience that informs how you do the work today? Like, yeah, I mean, I, I think sort of uh, you know when, when when you grow up, you know, afraid, you know, outside looking in. Uh, I think you, just, you notice more, you know, because again, again, you're just looking into the society that you're not a part of. So you begin to learn, you know, about what is happening from an outsider's perspective. And I, and I think I'm, I'm, I, I have that still. Uh, and, and then you also appreciate, you know, the mistakes and the stereotypes and you know, all the bad things people say about us. Because we say, no, that's not us. We're not less than. We're just as human as everyone else. And so I, I, that is really the, what was informed and, and driven my activism, my, my uh, organizing, you know, sort of energy to it, just to, just to validate who we are. So it, it is that, that sort of uh, energy and spirit that I think now I have the privilege of actually enacting in a lot of different ways. But it is that, it's sort of like the little cry that is like, we're here and we're, we're just as deserving as everyone else. You know, and we can give so much more to society if, if society would at least recognize us. I mean, I, you know, yesterday, I mean, I, some of you guys have saw this, but Donald Trump, he goes out there and t says that, oh, Mexicans are all, they're coming here with all problems and they're all, you know, cr criminals and, and rapists and all this. I mean, and, and, and I swear to you, some people across the country heard that and they nodded. Yes. 
They nodded in agreement to that ridiculous notion of who we are as a people. And so, and, 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 and it is that that belittles our humanity. And that's what it's sort of like I'm trying to showcase that that's actually not true. You know, we, we are more than that. And so, um, and, and then just to kind of, you know, present a different side of who we are. If I reframe what you said in a certain light, it is, uh, it's also a battle for communities that we serve to not accept those negative stereotypes about themselves. And your experience gave you an, an observation, a way to look at it and call out that it's, that's not us, that's what's been that's right. told about us. And I, I think it was beautiful. Um, so Christina, can we hear a little bit? Uh, thank you. Let's see. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to represent the private sector. Um, I uh, uh, just uh, less than two months ago uh, 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 was a significant anniversary. It was the 40 years since the fall of Saigon. And um, it really made me reflect just that actual celebration. Uh, just, you know, I didn't think about it. Unlike Jose, I didn't think about it for a very long time. Of what I went through and uh, what happened, uh, and what you know, what made me the way that I am. But um, I, uh, but um, you know, I was uh, you know just remembering the, the bombs falling all around our neighborhood, and uh, we uh, had a way out. My dad was uh, the chief of naval training for the Vietnamese Navy, and uh, the U.S. Navy um, sent him to the U.S. Uh, to get a full scholarship to get his education because he successfully helped uh, the Vietnamese, uh, uh, the U.S. Navy be the first to, uh, to, uh, to get out of Vietnam. And um, the strength of my mother who uh, had to figure our way out, she saw the bombs falling and uh, she took a lot of risks. And, and I have to attribute um, my, my mom for being so smart to... Um, you know, figure a way out. We knew a person, uh, a woman we never met before, who was married to an American GI who had a pass on one of the last U.S. Uh, cargo planes. And my mom gave her our gold and said, you know, get us on the plane. And, and when, uh, you know, she could have scammed us of uh, looking back, uh, the movie Last Days of Vietnam, the, the documentary that was on the... Uh, uh, nominee for the Oscars this year, I saw that a lot of people were scammed, didn't make it out, and, uh, and you know, realizing how lucky we were to get uh, out the day before the airport, the Saigon, Tencent Airport was bombed. And so um, I, I think understanding the, you know, just my fearlessness is having to leave everything behind and going into an, a new country and learning a new language and my parents had to start all over again. I mean, you know, and, uh, and there were people along the way that helped us and that was very, very important uh, to us because there were U.S. Naval families that helped us reestablish our lives. They took us into their basements. Uh, there were, you know, very, a lot of free clothing that was given to us uh, from the Salvation Army. And, uh, and then, you know, my parents having to start from scratch and for me to learn a new language, learning how to use a fork and, and, and really believing that I can, you know, really, I mean, I am the way that I am is, you know, just believing that I can break through the glass ceilings, get the right education um, and get to where I want to be uh, after having to start over again. Hmm. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and, and you know, I think the, the purpose of these stories aren't just to hear from extraordinary people, they're to really mine this story for what you do with it and how you use it to lead and, and hold the sort of unique solitude, frankly, of leadership. So before I go on, did, did anything any one of you said lead to a comment? Does anybody want to say anything? Because those are deep personal stories and you know, 